You know, every time we talk about climate change and mitigation and adaptation, it's normally a very external thing that people think we have to do only when planting trees and so much more. But what if I told you there are accessories to vehicle powering machinery that can help you to mitigate some of these things? Hello there, techies. My name is Brian Jedetieno. Branji, it's your biggest tech conversation in Africa on NTV. I have a lot lined up for you. But first off, as always, the tech news of the week. Nigerian neobank MoneyPoint has secured $110 million in equity financing to expand its integrated financial platform and overall growth across its continental markets. This largest funding brings MoneyPoint's valuation to over $1 billion, making it Africa's newest unicorn. During the company's 2022 funding cycle, when it raised $50 million, its valuation stood at $400 million. With this new valuation, MoneyPoint has joined the top-tier league of startups such as MNT Harlan, Interswitch, Flutterwave, Chipper, Opay, Wave and Andela. The Series C funding round was led by Development Partners International DPI, alongside Google's Africa Investment Fund, Verod Capital and Lightrock. MoneyPoint plans to use the funds to scale seamless digital payments, banking, foreign exchange FX and credit facilities. MoneyPoint previously raised $55 million and operates in Nigeria's expanding fintech market where digital financial services are in high demand among those without access to traditional banking. Toshi Enyorunda, founder and group CEO of MoneyPoint Inc., said the proceeds from this raise will speed up efforts to drive financial inclusion and support Africa's entrepreneurial potential. MoneyPoint was founded in 2015 by Toshi and Felix Ike, garnering trust from millions of businesses and banking partners over a decade to handle over 800 million transactions monthly. Last year, MoneyPoint grew its transaction value by over 205%. It processed 5.2 billion transactions worth over 150 billion US dollars. The fintech's role in facilitating financial inclusion saw it bag three awards from two separate events a few days ago in Lagos, Nigeria. The startup's growth prospects have not been fictionless. Earlier this year, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, tightened its policies on fintechs and banks, barring the new bank, among others, from onboarding new customers. MoneyPoint was also forced to overrule crypto transactions using its systems, possibly locking out valuable transactions. The company offers bank accounts to individuals and businesses, provides collateral free loans for enterprises, and supplies point-of-sale devices to small merchants. Its user base surged in February 2023 during a national crash shortage caused by the central bank's currency swap attempt. MoneyPoint's fundraising comes amid a broader decline in Africa startup investments. According to Africa The Big Deal, Africa startups raised $1.4 billion in the first nine months of 2024, a 38% decrease compared to the same period in 2022. Higher interest rates, especially in the United States, have contributed to this slowdown as investors become more risk-averse. Other founders in the industry have predicted that MoneyPoint will use the new funding to drive expansion across the continent, potentially through strategic acquisitions. Sources suggest Kenya may be the first market for this expansion with acquisition discussions reportedly already in progress. In Kenya, the fintech has been in talks to acquire Kopokopo, a fintech that provides short-term loans after the Competition Authority of Kenya approved the acquisition. In September, Kopokopo made several senior leadership changes, including appointing a new CEO, a new CFO, a chief risk officer, and a new CTO. Very well then, now you're up to speed with what's been happening in the tech world. Allow me now to talk about that one additive and the policies that are coming from the European Union, who are the biggest regulators of tech globally. So tell us just a little bit about what accessories can do to your normal commuting, powering your vehicle, and so much more. Steven from KBlue joins me now to speak about liquids that are now enabling you to move with more cleaner energy. Steven, good to see you. 
What solution are you solving in Africa, especially with regard to these additives that are now being brought about by the European Union? So basically, AdBlue is um, a diesel uh, exhaust uh, fluid. Uh, what it does is that uh, normally diesel run engines produce a lot of nitrogen oxides. Now, nitrogen oxides are one of the major polluters of the environment. And therefore, the European Union and the UN have, agencies have come up with uh, ways of reducing the um, Enox, we call them enox gases. They're just basically nitrogen oxide gases in the environment. And so one of the best ways is using AdBlue. So the way AdBlue works is that um, for newer vehicles that are run on uh, diesel, apart from the diesel tank, they have uh, an AdBlue tank. So instead of the exhaust uh, gases going direct to the environment, they are mixed with AdBlue, the AdBlue uh, product in a unit called a selective catalytic reduction unit. Basically, that's a unit that is um, in the exhaust system of these engines. So in that, in that uh, unit, AdBlue uh, reacts with the exhaust gases to reduce the nitrogen oxides to nitrogen and water. So instead of uh, releasing nitrogen oxides to the environment, we release nitrogen and water, which are harmless. AdBlue is basically a product made from deionized water and automotive grade urea in the ratios of that 2% urea and uh, the rest is deionized water. It's a, a trademark. AdBlue is actually a trademark. It's a, a trademark belonging to the German Automotive Industry Association. And so for you to make AdBlue, for you to make anything that you want to call AdBlue, you have to get a certification from uh, VDA. VDA is a... Um, German Automotive Industry Association. And so for K-Blue, we have that certification. So that's a product and that's what it does. What is the effect of this nitrogen oxide gases in our environment? So nitrogen oxide, as I said, is a major um, polluter in the environment. It produces, um, it reacts uh, with a lot of issues in the environment to produce a harmful effects on the ozone layer and producing uh, acidic uh, uh, issues into the environment. So basically, as I said, it's one of the major polluters of the environment. Talk to us about the production process and how you source your raw materials. So as I said, AdBlue is a mixture of two items, a deionized water and a automotive grade urea. So we import urea. Uh, mostly from China, so we import urea, and then our, our plant has capacity to make deionized water. So we take the normal water and we do a, a double uh, reverse osmosis treatment uh, so that we get uh, deionized water. So the only thing that we're importing is the, the automotive grade urea. The water, we treat it here to meet uh, the required standards. Who are currently your biggest clients? So uh, the, the, the reception so far in Africa is not very good. Uh, like um, the, the older vehicles did not have uh, uh, the AdBlue uh, units, but the newer ones, for example, the ones that are, uh, they are calling uh, Euro 6 vehicles, they come with that unit. It, 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 it's a unit that it's connected to you, the controls of your car such that the way you can't run on fuel, without fuel, when you don't have this product, you, you, you cannot run your vehicles. Now, one of the problems is that some people disable that uh, system so that they run without uh, AdBlue. I think the sensitization has not been very well in, in, in Africa, but in other countries you have... Um, you have where you have uh, uh, gas uh, systems. For example, in a petrol station, you have uh, a gas dispensing uh, unit and AdBlue dispensing unit, so that you, when you fill your car, you also put uh, AdBlue. But here, uh, the the sensitization has not been much. I think it's now that um, uh, we are now talking about climate issues in Africa. So the market has not been very good, and I think it's because of the sensitization. I think uh, with time. And with uh, the incoming of the modern vehicles into our country, I think we will get there. Would having electric vehicles be a threat to your business once you go that full cycle? Well, you see the good thing with the, with the diesel run engines, even when a time will come and uh, hypothetically we will not be having diesel run engines, there are systems that will still run on uh, diesel. For example, the construction equipment, heavy construction equipment, I believe for the foreseeable future will still run on diesel and they are one of the major polluters. And therefore, 
I don't see a huge impact on our business or, uh, as a result of uh, the electric uh, vehicles. Speak to us about the market access and the people you serve immediately. Uh, basically, we've been selling to uh, individuals, uh, the people that uh, are the Euro compliant, uh, Euro 6 compliant vehicles. We are also in talks with the uh, big garage, uh, garages. We want to put up um, uh, dispensing units into these garages so that as they do uh, servicing of their vehicle, then they also uh, do the ad blue with them. So basically it's uh, individuals that we have, we have been able to reach out to. But as I said, we have discussions with garages, uh, big uh, garages, eh? so that for them we want to install big units. Very well. Thank you so much, Stephen, for making time for us on NTV and just trying to understand how these accessories can be added into our normal vehicles to produce more cleaner gases. And there you have it, guys. You now know what the European Union wants of us to comply with globally. And that's where we leave it at for that first part. Part two comes up next, where we're going to know who our startup of the week is. You're watching Takeover. Don't go too far. Welcome back to Takeover. You're watching Africa's biggest tech conversation. Time now for our innovator this week. Your segment of Startup of the Week is on air. The COVID-19 pandemic heralded a new dawn for the logistics sector. With contained movement and contact, the directives to have only essential goods and services distributed meant there was going to be a surge in demand for logistics services. However, there was a challenge. The distribution and how to find the truck drivers was a pain for vendors who had now also resolved to e-commerce. At the time, young tech founders began to innovate and create centralized platforms where vendors and buyers could access these drivers and get services. Among them, Charles Tuo, a Kenyan resident in America and the founder of Apex Loads, an e-logistics firm that links vendors with reliable transport services in East Africa. We started development in uh, August, around August of 2020. Okay. So whenever we started, I uh, had the idea. We thought this is something that we can build in like six months. Yeah. Ended up taking uh, a year and a half. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of founders can relate. Mm -hmm. And but we started development about a year and a half later, uh, launched in the market in November of 2021. So started a, a trucking company in Oklahoma. Okay. So we bought a truck and uh, I was hiring a driver. But what you notice about logistics, you don't make a lot of money doing local stuff. Yeah. You have to do long distance. Yeah, long distance. But long distance means you're not going to be home every night, <laughs> right? So that's the catch. And a lot of drivers don't like that, so the, turn, the retention is not that great. Okay. You know, some drivers want to be home every night, some want to be home every weekend, which is a challenge. But then, by you know, getting into the industry, I was fully independent. I had my own license, authority, so I was the one, you know, independent. So Pretty booking much loads, myself, booking okay. loads, compliance. So I got into the thick of it. Okay. And then uh, it got to a critical point where. I was paying my driver more in a week than I was getting paid in two weeks as an engineer. And I was like, wait a minute, like, what's going on here, right? Cause no way. I, I tell that, you know, a lot of people don't believe because we grew up thinking, you know, if you're from Africa, you've got to be the lawyer, engineer, doctor. Yeah. But actually, the guy fixing your plumbing actually makes more money than you. And just like that, they created what would be called the Uber of logistics, serving Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania at the moment. However, he admits that this is a masses and volumes game, and the business gets profitable the more numbers you have. What a lot of people don't understand about logistics, uh, majority of people who perform those tasks are small companies. Yeah. Like, let's say, in North America, 70% of trucking companies only have one truck. In Africa, that's like 80 to 90%. Mm. It's only a few companies that have like 100 plus yeah, trucks. Yeah. But what that means, if you have like one or two trucks, 
you don't have the capacity to get a direct contract. Mm -hmm. Let's say like Unilever will never work with you if you have one truck. Yeah, you, true. You don't have the capacity. You don't have the capacity. But yeah. now, so now, uh, if you're a transporter with one or two trucks, you have to rely on freight brokers yeah. and freight forwarders to get your cargo. Yeah. But then now, how do you find these guys? And then that's when you, you see, like in Kenya, in Africa in general, uh, a typical broker or transporter will have like five to seven WhatsApp groups. And that's how they find each other, yeah. which is uh, chaos because you might find uh, some of these groups have like 200 members, 700 members, you know, 800 members. And in the same groups, there's people looking for work, there's people selling their trucks, there's people doing all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, other trades. Other trades. So it's not the most convenient way to match. Mm. This is how the app works. We have systems, you know, systems that empower three PLs to be able to find each other. Yeah. And one of those systems is what you call a load board. Yeah. And the simple concept of a load board is uh, if you have cargo, you go on the load board mm -hmm. and you post it. Okay. So if you're a broker, I'll post, hey, I have a load from Mombasa to Kampala. I need a flatbed. It weighs this much and I'm paying 2000 Okay. And then myself as a transporter, I will go on the same board and yeah. now I can see. I'll say, hey, there's a load. And you call the broker, hey, I'm calling about your load from Mombasa, mm -hmm. which it creates a controlled environment to streamline that matching. Mm -hmm. So whenever we looked at that did not exist in Africa, that's when we're like, hey, you know how this works. We <laughs> yeah, just why, build why didn't one. we put these things we together? We just build one and uh, that's how Apex Lotto was born. Charles says regulatory setbacks are the biggest hindrance to their driver verification. Credibility is a currency in logistics For because sure. this cargo is worth a lot of money. Yeah, true. And my biggest preposition that I say is uh, like right now, let's take, uh, for instance, the ride hailing apps. Yeah. If you order a ride, you're not worried about getting into a car with a stranger. Yeah. Or if you get a one of these platforms to book a hotel yeah. or, or uh, someone's house, you're not worried about sleeping in a stranger's house. There's that element of trust, of trust on the platform. Yeah. And that is the same trust that we need to implement in logistics in Africa. But how do we do that? Because whenever we launch in the market, and that question will come up, like, hey, Charles, how do I know I can trust this guy that I'm meeting on your platform? Yeah. And that's when we realize there's a, a regulation gap. Because like right now, if I'm going to verify a transporter in Kenya, I have to go to like three different organizations. Yeah. So my KYC will take anywhere from three to seven days. <laughs> so so you're checking at NTSA, all the things. NTSA, Sierra 12, insurance, I got to go to IPRS, verify your ID. Yeah. But now, so we created to provide that infrastructure for credentials verification. Wow. So we created the, the ESC profile. Because if you look at the same KYC that DHL is going to do, is the same KYC that AGL or SIVA or all these brokers are going to do. Sure. But the problem is they're not going to share that with, with someone else. But if we create a centralized database where everyone is verified, now you can own up the whole industry. Okay. And now that is the infrastructure that's why, uh, to promote credentials. So right now we call it the ESC profile. So once I verify you, I issue you a six-digit number mm -hmm. called an EAC number. Wow. You can think of it like a Huduma number. Like you know, if I had a, you know, I can see everything about you. Yeah. So if you're a transporter, I can see how many trucks you have, where your location is, how many wow. drivers you have, what type of cargo that you're dealing. If you're a broker, I know you, where your address is. That way, if I deliver your load, I'm not worried about you disappearing with the money, because mm -hmm. it happens. Yeah. Or if you're a transporter, I'm not worried about you selling my cargo along the way, because it also happens. Yeah. And so who insures the cargo? Insurance is a key component, yeah. because what you find like in Africa, there isn't a distinction between the liability of the truck okay. and the cargo protection. There's okay. no cargo insurance. Some yeah. people have like a goods in transit, but that should be the responsibility of a transporter. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if this cargo is on your truck, you're responsible for it. Yeah, true. So you're liable for it. But now you find that, like, let's say in Kenya, uh, let's say the, the maximum a policy will cover is like uh, uh, 10 million. Yeah. And, but that is the truck and the cargo. But now, how much is a truck? It's like 9 or 10 million. 9 or 10 million. So if I get into a wreck, 
I don't care about the cargo. I, I'm going to focus on replacing my truck. Because yeah. even if you don't give me a load, at least I got my truck back. So this is some of the conversation that we want to have with the, with the insurance regulation authority. Okay. That, hey, you need some policies. Okay. You need to have separate insurance covers. And also, like, what you find, which is very interesting, like in, in Kenya, you might have someone who has three trucks. But those three trucks have three different insurance policies. And that makes it very difficult to monitor compliance. Mm. So all those trucks should be under the same policy. Okay. And that way you don't have uh, insurance gaps. And just how do the markets compare? Uh, Uganda is landlocked, okay. you know, so you're not going to find a lot of freight forwarders, mostly broker dominated. But, you know, in, in Kenya, Tanzania, that's where you're going to find most of the uh, uh, brokers. Okay. Kenya is more open to adopting technology. Sure. Tanzania, you know, even uh, with there's some infrastructure issues whenever okay. it comes to con connectivity. Okay. Uh, Uganda also lags a little behind. So majority of the reception, you're going to get it from Kenya. Mm -hmm. But then you also got to consider, like, uh, dynamics. Where is a lot of this cargo moving? from because if you look at East Africa, Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, there's only four main logistics hubs, you know, Mombasa, Nairobi, Kampala and Dar es Salaam. Yeah. Obviously Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, that's where you're gonna have a lot of volume. So whenever it comes to users, most of our users are going to be in those two hubs. But then you also gotta consider the dynamics. So like uh, Tanzania, it's largely a cash market. Yeah. Which is what these guys trade in anyway. Because it's very informal. So whenever you look at the adoption, once we crack Tanzania or East Africa, we anticipate majority of our users are going to be from Tanzania. And that's our startup this week. I'll keep insisting, Kenyan innovators never cease to amaze me. And that is one of the biggest innovators we currently have who are sampling his work this week. Let's now get the DIY for this week. Here is your tech tip, and then we'll just end the show. Hi, my name is Duncan, and I'll be taking you through tech tip of the week. Almost everybody uses WhatsApp and as a way to ensure that your data is private and secure, it is important to ensure that your WhatsApp is safe. One way you can do this is by going to your WhatsApp settings, click account, click two-step verification, click turn on, set a six-digit pin that you're not going to forget, confirm it, and then save it. This is important because if somebody gets access to your phone number and tries to log into your WhatsApp, without this six-digit code, they'll not be able to. A bonus tip is adding an email address. And you do this the same way by going to settings, account, email address, write your email address, and there will be a code sent to your email. Put it right here and then verify. In case you lose that six digit code that you set earlier, you can use this link to reset it. That's it for this week and see you in the next one. Very well. As a motorist, you don't have an excuse as to why you are still emitting hazardous gases into the environment that are creating a lot of havoc in our environment. And that's where we leave it at for Takeover this week. Join us next week again for a very riveting conversation in tech. My name is Brian Jodotieno. Stay techy and may tech live forever. Thank you.